As President Clinton's mentor, Georgetown historian Carol Quigley, wrote in his 1966 book, Tragedy and Hope, the powers of financial capitalism had a far-reaching plan, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalistic fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements arrived at in frequent meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was to be the Bank for International Settlements in Bale, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. Each central bank sought to dominate its government by its ability to control treasury loans, to manipulate foreign exchanges, to influence the level of economic activity in the country, and to influence cooperative politicians by subsequent economic rewards in the business world. Despite intense pressure from the international bankers and the press, a handful of U.S. senators, led by Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, kept the U.S. out of these schemes. Without U.S. participation, the League was doomed. Incredibly, even though the U.S. rejected the World Central Bank, the BIS, the New York Federal Reserve ignored its government and arrogantly sent representatives to Switzerland to participate in the central bankers' meeting right up until 1994, when the U.S. was finally officially dragged into it. Their world government schemes thwarted, the bankers resorted to the old formula, another war to wear down the resistance to world government while reaping handsome profits. To this end, Wall Street helped resurrect Germany through the Thyssen banks, which were affiliated with the Harriman interest in New York, just as the Chase Bank had assisted in the financing of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia during World War I. Chase Bank was controlled by the Rockefeller family. Subsequently, it was merged with Warburg's Manhattan Bank to form the Chase Manhattan Bank. Now this has merged with Chemical Bank of New York, making it the largest Wall Street bank. Their strategy worked. Even before World War II was over, world government was back on track. In 1944, at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank were approved with full U.S. participation. The Second League of Nations, renamed the United Nations, was approved in 1945. Soon, a new international court system was functioning as well. All effective opposition to these international bodies before the war had evaporated in the heat of war, just as planned. These new organizations simply repeated on a world scale what the National Banking Act of 1864 and the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 had established in the U.S. They created a banking cartel composed of the world's central banks, which gradually assumed the power to dictate credit policies to the banks of all the nations. For example, just as the Federal Reserve Act authorized the creation of a new national fiat currency called Federal Reserve Notes, the IMF has been given the authority to issue a world fiat money called Special Drawing Rights, or SDRs. To date, the IMF has created in excess of $30 billion worth of SDRs. Member nations are being pressured to make their currencies fully exchangeable for SDRs. In 1968, Congress approved laws authorizing the Fed to accept SDRs as reserves in the U.S. and to issue Federal Reserve notes in exchange for SDRs. What does that mean? It means that in the U.S., SDRs are already a part of our lawful money. And what about gold? SDRs are already partially backed by gold. And with two-thirds of world gold now in the hands of central banks, the money changers can go about structuring the world's economic future in whichever way they deem most profitable.
Keep in mind, just as the Fed is controlled by its Board of Governors, the IMF is controlled by its Board of Governors, which are either the heads of the different central banks or the heads of the various national treasury departments dominated by their central banks. Voting power in the IMF gives the U.S. and the U.K., that is to say the Fed and the Bank of England, effective control. Just as the Fed controls the amount of money in the U.S., the BIS, IMF, and World Bank control the money supply for the world. So we see the repetition of the old goldsmith's fraud replicated on the national scale with central banks like the Fed and on the international scale by the three arms of the world central bank. Is this organization of the BIS, the IMF, and the World Bank, which we refer to collectively as the World Central Bank, presently expanding and contracting world credit? Yes. Regulations put into effect in 1988 by the BIS required the world's bankers to raise their capital and reserves to 8% of liabilities by 1992. Increased capital requirements put an upper limit to the fractional reserve lending, similar to the way cash reserve requirements do. What is this seemingly insignificant regulation made in a Swiss city eight years ago meant to the world? It means our banks cannot loan more and more money to buy more and more time before the next depression, as a maximum loan ratio is now set. It means those nations with the lowest bank reserves in their systems have already felt the terrible effects of this credit contraction as their banks scrambled to raise money to increase their reserves to 8%. To raise the money, they had to sell stocks, which depressed their stock markets and began the depression first in their countries. Japan, which in 1988 had among the lowest capital and reserve requirements, and thus was the most affected by the regulation, has experienced a financial crash which began almost immediately in 1989, which has wiped out a staggering 50% of the value of its stock market since 1990 and 60% of the value of its commercial real estate. The Bank of Japan has lowered its interest rates to one half of 1%, practically giving away money to resurrect the economy, but still the depression worsens. Due to the $20 billion U.S. bailout of Mexico, the financial collapse in that nation is already known here. Yet despite the bailout, the economy continues to be a disaster. One huge debt after another is rolled over as new loans are being made simply to enable Mexico to pay the interest on the old loans. In the south of Mexico, the poor have been in open revolt as every spare peso is being siphoned out of the country to make interest payments. It is important to note that a radical transfer of power is taking place as nations become subservient to a supranational world central bank controlled by a handful of the world's richest bankers. As the IMF creates more and more SDRs by the stroke of a pen on IMF ledgers, more and more nations borrow them to pay interest on their mounting debts and gradually fall under the control of the faceless bureaucrats of the World Central Bank. As the worldwide depression worsens and spreads, this will give the World Central Bank the power of economic life and death over these nations. It will decide which nations will be permitted to receive further loans and which nations will starve. Despite all the rhetoric about development and the alleviation of poverty, the result is a steady transfer of wealth from the debtor nations to the money changers' central banks which control the IMF and the World Bank. For example, in 1992, the third world debtor nations, which borrowed from the World Bank, paid $198 million more to the central banks of the developed nations for World Bank-funded purposes than they received from the World Bank. All this increases their permanent debt in exchange for temporary relief of poverty caused by prior borrowings.